Good morning, everyone. As we are just over a month from the start of the year for students, we know a safe return to school is so important for our kids. We're reading a lot about the difficulty of a return to school, and I get it. But let's not forget about the negative impact on our kids if we don't return. There are many of us who are privileged in some way, those with options moving into the school year. But what I worry about, what keeps me up at night, is those who don't. People working in grocery stores, construction jobs, and others who don't have the time to teach their kids and struggle to pay for childcare. What happens to their kids? What are they doing to keep up? How are they getting the support they need and deserve and what about the kids from more vulnerable families? Who's making sure they're learning, getting fed, and staying safe? And as Dr. Bell, the president of the Vermont uh, chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, told us a few weeks ago, and I'm quoting her here, many of our kids are not doing OK. Think about that for just a moment. I truly believe if we don't provide a way to get those kids back into school, we'll see the ramifications for years to come. That's why this is so important to me. And while our case trends show we can do it, I'm going to continue to advocate for it. But I acknowledge and understand there's some anxiety among school employees and parents. And appropriately, there are a lot of questions being, being asked. So we'll be dedicating time each week to give you an update on our work to support schools, teachers, parents, and kids in a safe return this year. It's important to remember we're not always going to have all the answers. And often there won't be one simple answer because each of our schools and communities are so different. And they're different because that's the independence that Vermonters have demanded. But just like we have in all areas of this crisis, we want to give you the information we have. Take your questions and be upfront with our approach, our data, and what we're seeing across the state. Unlike many states across the country, the conditions of Vermont support a return to in-person instruction because of our low prevalence of COVID and our testing and tracing capability. But I have, um, but having said that, uh, it's still important to recognize that things will be different and this won't be easy. As we've said before, because of the nature of this virus, and even though we have the lowest number of ca cases in the, in the nation, we're likely to see some cases and clusters connected to schools. And there will also be false alarms and rumors that spark fear, even if no cases are found. Adjusting to this may be difficult for some, but we want to remind Vermonters that we as a state, nation, and across the world know so much more about this virus today than we did in March when we had to shut down schools. And in Vermont, we worked hard to build up a testing and tracing system that can surround and contain clusters and outbreaks before they become widespread. This has been key to our reopening where we've seen cases connected to work sites and even childcare centers, but they have not resulted in transmission like we saw this spring or other states are seeing today. That's in large part thanks to the majority of Vermonters who followed our health guidance, quarantined when needed, and changed their behavior to keep each other safe. But it's also because we have an incredible and proven testing and tracing team that's ready to act quickly to contain clusters. Dr. Kelso, our state epidemiologist, is going to talk to you about this approach to testing and why this containment strategy is a top priority. And we'll be sharing more in the weeks to come because we know faith in our testing and tracing program is key to confidence in school openings. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Kelso. Thank you, Governor. Vermont data and Vermont's pediatric medical community continues to support the safe opening of schools and we will be ready to reassess that at any point. 
Some individuals are at higher risk of developing severe illness from COVID-19. Among adults, the risk of severe illness increases with age, uh, with older adults at higher risk. We understand that there's fear and uncertainty. I want to tell you what the Health Department and Agency of Education are doing along with schools to prepare. We have three main approaches. Decreasing the risk of individuals infected with COVID-19 from entering schools. Decreasing transmission among staff and students. And quickly identifying individuals with COVID-19 and putting containment procedures in place. And of course, we'll communicate regularly with staff, students, families, and communities. Schools should plan for cases of COVID-19. Administrators will have plans in place to manage infection prevention, communication, and education programs should anyone in the school test positive. The Health Department is actively developing tools to support this planning for when there is a positive case, including communication plans for staff, families, and the community. Older adults in the school and those with specific underlying medical conditions should talk to their health care provider to assess their risk and determine if they should avoid in-person contact when physical distancing cannot be maintained. Testing asymptomatic people in an environment where there's a high degree of virus suppression isn't the recommended epi epidemiologic approach or the best strategy for containing clusters. Our experience with childcare indicates that we have an effective approach to identify clusters and contain them without seeing broader community spread. We have had over 300 childcare providers working in childcare for essential workers for the last several months. And there have been about five adults working in childcare who tested positive for COVID, and all of them acquired COVID outside of the childcare setting. We know the national testing system is strained, and we have to use our testing capacity strategically so we can surround and contain cases that arise, limiting outbreaks and spread that leads to increased transmission in the community. Higher education requires a different approach because we're bringing in large numbers of adult students from many from other states where there is a much greater transmission rate than we have in Vermont. And then we're mixing those adult students in dormitory and co-living environments. We don't have the same concerns with K through 12 where students have been living in Vermont where the virus um, activity is low. And testing is not prevention. It only tells you whether you have the virus in your nose at the point in time on the day when you are tested. So it can be falsely reassuring if a test is positive, is negative. A decision to close a school or a certain classroom for in-person instruction, um, for example, dismissing students for the day or doing remote learning for the day, will be made with the superintendent or head of school and the health department. Decisions to close for in-person instruction will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the situation in the school. If the school is cohorting students in, in a single classroom, for example, um, our most likely recommendation from the health department will be to close that classroom, just that one classroom, for in-person instruction for about a day, 24 hours or so, while we get started with our contact tracing. If students are moving about and in multiple classrooms and mixing with each other more, uh, we might recommend to um, close all impacted classrooms, again, just for a day while we do contact tracing. We'll use that time to gather facts about the situation. We'll convene a rapid response team with the school um, and initiate contact tracing. And based on that information, we'll make further recommendations regarding any further closure for in-person instruction or other infection control prevention measures. We've been building our contact tracing capacity since March, and we have a robust team that's ready we can open schools safely. I've been reassured time and time again with each new case that's been reported that our containment strategies are working. It's mission critical to open schools and we have to try. There may be no safer place to do it than in Vermont. And now I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Kelso. Uh, good morning. Uh, later today, we will be releasing an update to our Safe and Healthy Start guidance for reopening our K-12 schools. I want to thank the Vermont Department of Health for their leadership in this work and the many educators and health experts who continue to participate in this process. When I consider the reopening guidance for schools produced by other states and the guidance produced by the CDC, I would characterize Vermont's health guidance as being fairly comprehensive. With today's update, we are adding to this already comprehensive guidance to include changes based on new health information. We are also introducing changes designed to make the guidance more useful in its implementation based on the feedback we have received from many educators in our school districts who are now engaged in the very difficult work of reopening their schools. I thought I would take this moment this morning to highlight some of the more significant revisions in our guidance. Firstly, uh, the assumption of the guidance remains the same in that our guidance continues to be based on the assumption of Vermont maintaining a high degree of suppression of the virus. Our initial guidance, when published in mid-June, came to the same conclusion, and this remains a central element behind the logic in our planning. One change I would like to highlight, based on a consensus view that has emerged in the public health field in the last few months, is that our guidance now includes a strong recommendation for in-person instruction for younger students, particularly for those students in grades kindergarten through grade five. I would add to that strong health recommendation that there is also a strong educational rationale for seeking to implement in-person instruction for these students, since they are at their formative years and schools play a critical role in their healthy development. Our guidance remains structured around the same three levels, precautions that must be implemented to prevent the virus from entering our schools, precautions that must be implemented to prevent its spread if it were to be found in the schools, and steps that must be taken to address the needs of students and staff if they become ill during the school day. <clears throat> in terms of preventing the virus from entering our schools, we have made a change to the recommendation on the daily health check process. Previously, it was required to be implemented by school personnel, meaning that school employees would administer the required questionnaire and temperature check to students at the first point of contact with the school system. This has now changed to allow parents or students to complete these questionnaires themselves. And these questionnaires may be completed at the first point of contact with the district or before entering a school building. Student temperature checks will still be completed by school staff, but these too can also be completed at the first point of contact or before entering a school building. There were several reasons for making this change. One reason had to do with the change in the CDC guidance on the significance of symptom checking and temperature checks. Although these remain important screening tools, they do not address the concern necessarily of asymptomatic individuals, or that many of the symptoms of COVID-19 are the exact same symptoms experienced by all people, especially children, during cold or flu season. Another reason for making this change had to do with its practicality. We heard from many districts that it was going to be difficult to implement health checks by school personnel at first point of contact, especially when we consider the first point of contact is often a school bus. We think the revisions we are announcing today provide a more doable approach, while also preserving the utility of these screening measures from a safety perspective. In the revised guidance, we will also be making a change to the distancing, distancing recommendation for younger students. Six feet remains the distancing recommendation for older students. An expanding body of scientific evidence continues to support the finding that younger children less than 10 years old are least likely to acquire COVID-19 and least likely to transmit it to others when infected, even in very close contact scenarios. Therefore, the recommendation for distancing of these students has changed from six feet to a range of three to six feet. There are many other changes to the guidance that we believe will make the guidance more useful and informative from an implementation perspective. In terms of implementation, we acknowledge that this guidance needs to remain fairly stable so school districts can count on consistent and specific guidance from the state on these important issues. At the same time, however, I've communicated to school districts that we will undertake a regular review of this guidance, at least on a monthly basis, to make sure it is based on the latest health information. We will also make regular changes to improve its utility based on the feedback that we receive. Lastly, I would like to highlight that our original version of this guidance included a brief section on the social and emotional well-being of students and staff. 
which are important considerations for the overall health of our schools. I would now like to introduce Deputy Secretary Boucher, who's been leading up a task force we created to address these issues in more detail. Thank you, Secretary French. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm pleased to provide a summary of the work that we've been doing to ensure that students and educators' social, emotional, and mental health needs are taken care of as we move back to in-person and hybrid instruction this fall. This is a really critical issue that we simply must get right. We know this has been a stressful time for students and school personnel, as others have uh, commented already this morning. Due to COVID-19 and its economic and health impact, but also given that many people have been affected by systemic racial injustice, as the murder of George Floyd and subsequent state and national attention to racism has underscored. The pandemic and systematic racial injustices, sometimes both, have had a negative impact on adjustment and mental health for at least some families and at least some teachers and staff in our local districts throughout Vermont. We recognized this and we're eager to assist districts in addressing these issues as we all move toward school reentry. For the past several weeks, individuals across a variety of stakeholder groups from education, mental health, and related fields have collaborated to draft guidance that will help districts operate from a stance of well-being. In addition to staff from both the Agency of Education and the Department of Mental Health, representatives for classroom teachers, the Vermont NEA, school counselors, special education directors and professionals, principals, superintendents, medical directors, staff from regional mental health agencies, and health prevention specialists all work together to hash out the most important key information that schools and districts need to ensure that students are socially, emotionally, and physically supported so they can effectively learn and grow in the context of COVID-19. In addition, we focused on what districts need to do to ensure that educators and support staff are socio-emotionally well, both for their own personal health and in order to effectively educate our students. These were two of the guiding principles that framed our work together. We're putting final touches on the document and anticipate having it out for uh, the public uh, within the week. I want to highlight a few critical points that are included. First, we intentionally focused on both students and educators, and by educators I'm speaking about teachers, staff, and administrators. The prospect of returning to school has raised concern for many, both families and teachers. The health guidance supports a return to in-person instruction, particularly in Vermont, as we've again heard this morning, but this doesn't mean we ignore the fact that this is an unprecedented and stressful time for many. Whereas some folks can't wait to get back into the classroom, others are understandably feeling anxious about what the new normal entails. We recommend that local systems first take care of the adults, ensuring they are comfortable, safe, and aware because with, without addressing teacher and staff needs, we cannot possibly address student learning. Second, use recommended planning teams already in place, if this, this makes sense, to address both physical safety and well-being. Local systems, as we know, have been working hard to address the recommended safety principles in the health guidance. We urge them to use the same team-based, multidisciplinary approach to address well-being and socio-emotional health. Invite in community members, including those who you've been working with all along, and any new entities. Think about food banks, youth groups, poverty assistance programs in your region or your community who can help schools wrap supports around families. Be sure you are also planning intentionally to make taking care of oneself an everyday normal part of the school day for both educators and staff as well as students. Finally, we want schools and districts to adopt a long-range stance when it comes to well-being and mental health. It will certainly be important to fully engage families, communicate with, and listen to teachers and staff, and provide relevant professional learning opportunities in preparation for school re-entry in a few weeks. However, the nature of well-being also means that we need to sustain our work in this area. What are some of the practices you'll engage in throughout the year to keep employees and students resilient, well-nourished, and healthy? 
Consider incorporating physical movement into each person's day, whether outside or safely within the classroom. Leverage your hardworking school counselors and social workers in new ways. They are eager to assist. Teach and reteach new expectations and routines. And don't forget how powerful humor can be at allaying fear and tension. These are but a few of the suggestions we highlight in the guidance. I'm very grateful for the collaborators on this work. There's quite a list, as, as you heard earlier in my comments. Without their significant expertise and different perspectives, there is no way we could have come up with the comprehensive practical guide that we've developed. After all, mental health and well-being transcend all aspects of life. We didn't have an easy task before us, working largely without a unified roadmap and across groups that typically work in silos, but the shared principle we all had was a commitment to ensuring that educators and students are well. I'm thrilled that so many were willing to jump in, roll up their sleeves, and get the work done, given that they were also dealing with the ongoing planning efforts, many of them, um, for um, in-person instruction and school reentry. And I'm confident that the recommendations we crafted will help districts think about and address the well-being and mental health challenges that may arise. Now I'll turn it over to Jay Nichols, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association, who will discuss uh, the new sports guidance. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Boucher. I'm pleased to announce that we will have a fall sports season. But as the governor stated last week, fall sports will look different than they have in the past. We, the VPA, proposed a fall sports plan earlier this summer and shared that with members of the administration. This led to the development of a fall sports working group that included superintendents, athletic directors, a representative from the VPA, Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, medical professionals, principals, and members of the administration with final approval coming from the Department of Health. Throughout this process, our sports experts deferred to the health experts in the Department of Health on any questions of best practice related to physical safety and mitigation strategies regarding the COVID-19 virus. This is as it should be. We at the VPA are committed to providing high quality extracurricular activities for students, including sports, in as safe a manner as possible. However, we are not medical professionals and we acknowledge that. Working within the parameters set by the Department of Health and with various stakeholders and medical professionals, we collectively have developed a plan that will allow for all fall sports to occur in some manner or another. Some of the key points from the guidance that I believe is being jointly issued by the Department of Health and Agency of Education are as follows. Schools will be able to begin official fall practices starting on September 8th. This is consistent with the governor's mandated beginning of school announcement. While Vermont schools are in step two, teams will be able to have practices, conditioning activities, and skill development. And they will also be able to scrimmage within their own team or program. However, Scrimmages versus other schools are not allowed in step two. When schools move to step three, scrimmages as well as competitions between other schools is permitted. Facial coverings will be required for all players, coaches, officials, staff, and spectators at all times. This includes during active play. The only exception to this is for cross country running. And there will be some specific guidelines around cross country looking at staggered starts and other mitigation strategies. We anticipate moving from step two to step three for schools after the first two weeks of school. So hopefully this will mean that schools can engage in interscholastic events with other schools by September 21st if all goes well. In terms of spectators, any outside event hosted by a school will have to adhere to the event size restrictions that are currently in place at the state level. Currently, that number is 150 for an outside event. The VPA will issue more detailed guidance this week to help schools implement the fall sports program's guidance. Each VPA sanctioned sport has a committee that helps to oversee that sport in Vermont. It's important to remember each of these committee members are volunteers. <clears throat> they are made up of coaches, athletic directors, officials, others that are involved in that particular sport. As of this press conference, 
All the fall sports committees are working actively on how best to proceed with their individual sports, given the guidance. Because I know there will be questions about certain sports, let me add the following. For volleyball, volleyball teams will be able to hold practices, skill development, and inter-squad scrimmages, but will not be able to have competition versus other schools inside their building. This is consistent with the guidance on healthy reopening of schools. Volleyball programs can, however, have outdoor matches versus other schools if they so choose. Football may hold practice sessions limited to low contact physical conditioning and skill development. Full contact scrimmages and games will not occur during the fall 2020 season. However, the football committee is developing a plan for a seven on seven touch football season for this fall. Our goal is to make sure as many athletes as possible can participate in their sports. We expect guidance for winter sports to be published by October 15th, 2020. And at this point, I turn the podium back over to Governor Scott. Thank you, Jay. Uh, with that, we'll open it up for questions. All right, uh, just for everybody's awareness, it is 1130 and we do have a long queue today, 23 reporters in the queue. So please keep that in mind with your questions. We'll start in the room with Calvin. All right, uh, thank you. So, Governor, as you know, today's primary day and um, you're in a contested race. I'm just wondering, first off, why are you holding a press conference today and if you think that's appropriate? Well, from my standpoint, uh, we've been holding them on Tuesdays uh, and the pandemic comes first. Uh, my first responsibility is for the public safety of Vermonters and I think during a pandemic, I believe that Vermonters will understand. I've not actively campaigned. I've not actively fundraised. Uh, I've not even brought up uh, the campaign during any of these, uh, uh, these press conferences. I've only reacted to questions that have come, out, come about. So I think it's appropriate. If I had held it tomorrow, um, we'd still be uh, talking probably about the campaign and, and, the, uh, and the primary. So uh, from my standpoint, um, if we get no questions on the primary, I'm fine with that. We can stick right to the education portion. And follow-up question either for you or maybe Secretary French. Um, <clears throat> lots of schools have already pumped money into these very specific plans for six feet apart. So I'm wondering what your message is to districts that um, maybe have to go back and relook at their plans, or as you're saying, we might up, uh, review these every month. So that sort of uncertainty, if you could uh, address that. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an important consideration, as I mentioned towards the end of my remarks. Um, we, we, at the one hand, have to be responsive to changing health information. On the other hand, we have to keep an eye on the practical implementations of actually doing the work at the local level. Uh, so part of the strategy around communicating that is really, you know, I meet weekly with the superintendents and we sort of telegraph that this change was coming. Uh, we have a large number of educators on that committee and they've been sort of messaging that out to their associations. Um, and I think lastly, just uh, we have that additional week or so due to the governor's executive order. So I think there's sufficient time to make those adjustments. I also think they're not necessarily um, totally disruptive to what's already been put in place. They're just sort of an embellishment of the current guidance and provides some additional flexibility in some cases. So this isn't really a surprise? It shouldn't be a surprise to many of the folks in the field. I think, you know, as, as Dr. Levine and other health folks have been communicating, this has been a consensus position developed for some time in the medical community. Um, and once again, I think uh, anything we can do to impart some flexibility to our districts and implementing their plans would be welcome at this point. Uh, Governor, earlier this week, we learned that some students at Norwich University had violated COVID regulations. How concerned are you that this could continue at other universities as students begin to come back to school? Well, I think it's important uh, that the schools, the universities, and I, I have great faith in their response to this, uh, but they have to set an example about how we expect uh, this to progress uh, throughout this uh, reopening of the university. So uh, I have not spoken uh, to the university at this point, um, but, um, but I believe uh, that they will handle this appropriately. Steve? Yes, uh, just a quick question, Commissioner uh, French, on the um, on the numbers, do we have any idea now on the numbers of uh, schools and where they're going? Are they the library? Are they, uh, you know, off campus or on campus? 
And we don't have numbers. We are starting to collect their plans. Uh, and uh, I think what I've observed, there are still several districts that are finalizing those plans this week. Uh, those districts, uh, from my perspective, were involved in sort of lengthier community or deliberative uh, conversations. And so they've been working all along and finalizing those plans. But they're, they're this week, there are several boards that are voting on to adopting those plans. But I should have a better handle on those numbers starting next week. I, I still expect a vast majority of districts to be implementing some form of hybrid instruction. Moving to the phones, we'll start with Greg from the County Courier. Greg, the County Courier. All right, we'll go to Ed at Newport Daily Express. Good, uh, good morning. <clears throat> My question would be directed to uh, Dan French. Uh, in the governor's opening statements and the statements you followed up with, uh, it's obvious that we're going through times that are very turbulent and we really don't know what the future brings. And therefore, Department of Health and Agency of Education are trying to stay flexible along with school administrators. The question I have is I've seen some of the supervisor union plans and there is no flexibility for parents. If a parent chooses remote learning, then things change over the course of school year. They don't have the option of putting their children into another program. My question is, is why is it reasonable to allow no flexibility for parents to make adjustments to their children's education as they see fit? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, to your observation, uh, that we're in for an uncertain fall. And I think by definition, that's meant we've had to bake a certain amount of flexibility, if you will, into our planning. Um, I will say, you know, the, as I mentioned, um, there is stability in the conditions uh, of our the virus in Vermont. And that's an important consideration as we're uh, contemplating changes to our plans. Our plans in Vermont look different than many other states precisely because we have a low rate of contagion. But I think the issue of flexibility and how to resolve those issues is we, if we, uh, I've made the case that that needs to be a local conversation. And in particular with school boards and the administration, they do have to reconcile uh, parent interest, also uh, the staff availability and a variety of other logistical issues. So it's not quite as simple as giving parents complete choice of their options. Those, those systems need to be designed essentially from scratch as a result of this emergency. And it requires communities to reconcile these uh, sort of disparate uh, points of view, if you will. Um, but that's, I think, the best approach in Vermont. And that's the best we can do, as imperfect as that might sound. I think that, that sort of uh, reconciliation of those points of view is best, best uh, occurring at the local level. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa, Associated Press. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Governor, you're, you're expected to win the primary. After that, will you be actively campaigning for the November election? Will you be hiring campaign staff or anything like that? I think, um, well, we'll see. Um, obviously, we want to get through this qualifying round. We'll see what happens tonight. Uh, I'm not sure that it's a, a lock-in uh, that I win the primary. So I think uh, we'll reflect on that after tonight. <laughs> Okay, and I just have one other question about the, um, I think for Patsy Kelso, about the, um, uh, the school plan. When there is an event, when a, someone is, a student has COVID and then you said they would close the classroom, you mean physically close the classroom so that students and staff would not be in there, or do you mean that class would be somehow restricted from other places and then? What about what happens to those other students who were in the classroom, you know, the following day? Yeah, great questions. Probably similar questions that a lot of parents have t right now. Um, <clears throat> we will take each situation as it comes. And, um, you know, the first thing is to um, get the students probably home uh, for remote learning um, just for a day while we do our contact investigation talk to the case and the school administrators and find out what kind of contact there's been between the, the child or adult who has COVID and others, um, how many close contacts are there. And, and 
is it appropriate to keep people you know, maybe at home uh, versus allowing most of them to come back the next day? Um, just because there's a case of COVID in a classroom does not mean that every other person in that classroom is a close contact. That's why we're doing things like physical distancing and wearing masks and washing our hands to avoid having everyone be in contact with um, others, even if they're in the same room. So, you know, we'll have to see how, how the cases play out. Um, but my impression is that, um, you know, we may ha identify a few close contacts for, for each case and appropriately quarantine those, those people and the rest can proceed with their um, instruction as they had been before. Okay, uh, and one more question about the younger children. Um, is social distancing going from six feet to three feet? Um, why even have distancing at all then if you're going down to three feet? Isn't, isn't the, um, the sort of standard two feet? Yeah, just because we're saying um, three to six feet for the younger children doesn't mean that they need to be um, as close as three feet. Ideally, you know, they'll still be able to manage the six foot distance, but we're allowing flexibility because the best data that we have shows that for younger children, um, being three feet apart is enough to pre prevent the majority of transmission. Um, so we're following the science and um, if they can, uh, you know, use their plans to keep them six feet apart, that's even better. Okay, thank you. Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. Governor, you said uh, the decision to reopen schools to in-person in learning will almost certainly result in additional cases of COVID-19 in Vermont. Um, in your own, like, personal thinking about this, what What's the number of cases that you're willing to accept um, in order to proceed with this school reopening plan? Yeah, I don't know if there's a threshold uh, for me. It uh, hasn't been something that I've content, uh, contemplated, um, but obviously we'll be working as a team as we have throughout this pandemic uh, with, with Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, uh, Secretary French and others uh, about what it means and whether it's appropriate uh, to continue or to modify uh, that approach. So there's not uh, a set number from my standpoint, um, unless uh, uh, Dr. Levine has one or Dr. Kelso has one, but I, but I believe um, we'll just keep reassessing on a daily basis uh, what we're seeing in the field. Um, but you are effectively asking teachers to assume uh, some level of risk to their own personal health and safety to, to serve these students. Yeah, I mean, we're all taking risks uh, during this pandemic. I think that uh, those who are on the front lines, whether they're in the grocery stores or uh, in the restaurants or on the construction sites uh, or child care providers or those in health care are all taking risks every single day. Um, that's uh, part of uh, what we're going through. And, um, and unfortunately, I, I, we have to do some of the equations. What's best uh, for our kids? And I just want to continue to focus on that. I'm really uh, concerned uh, about those, uh, those children, those kids uh, that fall between the cracks where there's nobody at home uh, to take care of them properly, uh, to help them uh, proceed and get a, an edu the education they deserve. Um, and this isn't just about putting them on pause, because if you put them on pause for a year, let's say, uh, I'm not sure that you can pick up where you left off. Uh, I think some of the damage will be done uh, in that year that we'll see in years to come. So I'm uh, incredibly um, concerned uh, about, uh, about that uh, provision, and uh, that's why I'm committed to doing all we can to get them back into school. Now, again, if we can't do it here, and I heard uh, Governor Cuomo actually say if New York can't do it, and he, he announced last week that they were uh, moving to in-person instruction if they were below a certain positivity rate, and he said, I think his remark was that if New York can't do it, uh, nobody can. And I would say uh, that if New York can do it, Vermont certainly can. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. I have a question from a community member. 
who was immunocompromised with his lungs, heart, and kidney. And he wants to know what protocol should he follow when his wife returns to classroom four times a week? What will his ongoing, what will they do in terms of masks, washing their clothes, taking their temps every day? And his wife will be returning to teach um, 11 to 13 year olds. And given that we've been told to budget our exposure, how should this family budget their exposure? I'm going to let uh, Dr. Levine or Dr. Kelso answer that. Thank you. That's a very timely question because uh, I've been working with infectious disease physicians at the university and others in the medical society. Uh, just today, uh, we're putting the final touches on some guidance for physicians and other clinicians who are going to be asked exactly these kinds of questions. So it's not really uh, an exposure budget here in this case. It's really assessing a level of risk. Risk can be low, can be moderate, can be high. I don't have a lot of details on your community member. They sound like they um, could be a person that many of us would regard in a higher risk group if they've had some transplants, if they were on uh, immunomodulating therapies to protect them uh, from rejecting transplants, et cetera. Um, so um, that's the kind of discussion we actually encourage and want patients and their loved ones to have with their clinicians to assess their level of risk and help in the context of everything understand um, if being in a classroom setting for that individual might not be the best idea. Uh, because of the loved one they have at home. So I can't give a black and white answer because obviously everything has got to be very individualized, but those are the kinds of uh, issues that if they come up, uh, people will be discussing with their health care providers and coming to the appropriate conclusion. We obviously have the guidance of um, the Centers for Disease Control regarding a person's own individual risk. Uh, and their ability to assess it based on whatever kinds of chronic or other conditions, immune suppressing conditions they may have, and that can be very useful uh, as well. So I, again, I'm trying to be uh, a bit more general in my comments regarding that. Obviously we do hear this all the time that people have a loved one at home that they want to protect and wonder if they're engagement in their profession or in society in general is a good idea. Still have to emphasize the four fundamentals of guidance that we always give uh, because they will not only protect the person themselves but the loved one that they're concerned about. Uh, and that of course involves the hand washing and the fact that people need to be masking and appropriately physically distancing. Because if they can protect themselves that way, that's all they need to do to protect their loved one. Does that pretty much give you the uh, answer you needed? I think we might have lost. I guess so. <laughs> no, um, thank you very much. I did get cut off, but I just got back on to say thanks. Thank you. I'll move to Kat, WCAS. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, I'm trying to reconcile a study that came out on Thursday talking about how infected children have at least as much of the coronavirus in their noses and throats as infected adults do. Um, and those, some of the children, children studied in that were definitely children within that age range that we now say can get a little closer to each other in classrooms. How do you reconcile some of these studies coming out that talk about children being infected and being able to have this virus? when we also are talking about putting them closer together in enclosed spaces. Dr. Levine. Yes, thanks, Kat. I, I haven't looked up the definition lately, but I think the word reconcile is probably the right word for us to pivot on here because we're trying to balance this information which says that in very recent data, there may be a significant carriage of the virus in the nasal secretions that could be infectious, theoretically, of some kids 
versus the more abundant and uh, also recent in the terms of a pandemic evidence that there has been um, very little in the way of child to child transmission of virus within like a classroom setting or a school setting and that in fact as Dr. Kelso repeated with the child care experience we have in Vermont that the majority of infections seem to come from an adult and then be transmitted to the child as opposed to the other direction. Um, most of the data that came out in, if we're talking about the same study, uh, was in a research letter. Uh, there was not a lot of information provided and we don't really know the implications of it because it was mostly a study of what's going on in the secretions um, of the noses of those uh, individuals that were tested. And they looked at uh, children, they looked at uh, who were younger, they looked at older children, and they looked at adults. And they looked at a concept called the uh, cyclic threshold, uh, which had to do with potentially how infective that person could be. And they found high cyclic thresholds in the younger children. But again, we need to be able to translate that into what actually happens in the real world with, with that population. And that's the more challenging point. I might also comment that um, there's been some recent literature looking at the United States experience in this more recent uh, few weeks to month and finding uh, more children impacted by the virus. I would caution everybody to understand that those numbers are coming from, in many cases, states where there's a huge surge in disease activity and where the whole population has had a very high test positivity rate and schools were opened very early, often earlier in the summer than we would traditionally regard as early even in Vermont terms. Um, and those schools were opened at a time of high virus prevalence in the communities. I've always said and I'll continue to say that whether we're looking at our schools or whether we're looking at our colleges or what have you, um, they are all microcosms of our greater community. So when the adults in these various communities come from the community, their amount of disease is going to be reflective of what's in the community. And if you're doing that in a high surge state, the teachers are a part of a community uh, and the kids are part of a community that has a high prevalence of virus from the get-go. So you might find when you put them all together in a school that that may not go so well versus a very low prevalence community like we have in the state of Vermont where people are not going to be able to have a high enough rate of infection from the community to make that as much of a concern in the school setting. Thank you. Dan Wallace-Allen, VT Digger. Hi, um, this is a question for Commissioner Jim Baker, if he's on the phone somewhere. I don't believe he's on the phone. Uh, can, would it be appropriate for Secretary Smith? Um, possibly. Um, hi, Secretary Smith. Has Core Civic, this is all about Core Civic, my question. So, up to you guys, but I'm wondering if Core Civic has, I know that Smith Corrections is trying to get Core Civic to test all the inmates in the Mississippi prison, um, and I was wondering if they had actually done that. Um, Commissioner Baker, and I'm stepping in for Commissioner Baker today, I'm sorry about that, but um, the Commissioner Baker has spoken with the CEO. They have agreed that they want to test all inmates uh, within that facility. Right now, what Core Civic is doing is contacting the other states to get permission to, uh, con uh, to test their uh, inmates in that other prison. So um, I will just say stand by. We're waiting on uh, that permission from the other states. But as you um, probably know, uh, we retested the negative uh, inmates on uh, uh, just the other day and are still waiting the test results uh, from those. As, as you know, we test on a regular basis yeah. those negative uh, inmates. But 
Uh, we're waiting on course. CoreCivic has agreed to test the inmates. They are testing all their um, uh, correctional officers now. I think that started yesterday. And so we'll, we'll wait to see what the other states have to say. So that means that you don't know yet if there are any new positive tests of Vermont inmates over in Mississippi? We know exactly right now what the positive rates were last week. Um, we retest okay. on a seven-day period those negatives. The positives are the positives. Uh, we retest uh, the negatives uh, on a seven-day period. We don't have the results back. We've retested the negatives. We don't have the results back yet. Um, and how are those positive inmates doing? How are they health-wise? Most are asymptomatic, according to the doctor that um, Dr. Strenio that we sent down there. We have one uh, that spent uh, an overnight last night in uh, the local hospital. Uh, o the O2 saturation levels were um, were below what we had expected in there. Uh, primarily, that was a precautionary uh, reason to. Uh, uh, put that inmate into the hospital for the overnight. I don't know the status of whether that person has been returned to the correctional facility, uh, but there were two reasons for that. One, uh, concern to make sure that the uh, low uh, O2 saturation rate was uh, addressed, and secondly, uh, the inmate uh, wasn't adhering to the protocol of keeping the O2 device on. So the, the consensus was, put that uh, inmate into the hospital so that it could, the O2 levels could be monitored and secondly that the O2 device uh, could, be, um, could be kept on. Um, what about um, in Rutland at the Marble Valley uh, facility, what has been the result of mass testing of um, staff there. Yeah, yeah, the um, the other day uh, we did a mass test. Um, I'm losing track of days, but I think it was Friday. We did a mass test of the uh, facility in Marble Valley. Other than the people that we have identified, the six that are, that are coming in uh, that came in from Mississippi, and then a seventh inmate uh, that was in the quarantine area. Uh, all tests came back negative. We did have a correctional officer who got a separate test, not in the mass testing that we did. Um, that has come back positive. That, uh, that in, uh, excuse me, that correctional officer was in the quarantine area where that is something that I'm looking at right now, just came in just moments ago. Hmm. Um, all right. Uh uh, sorry, just a couple more questions in terms sure. of Governor Scott. Um, oh. Governor, you said last week that teachers are being given the choice about whether to teach remotely or in person, but no, I'm not sure, and I can't tell from this press conference whether that's still um, the case. Well, I think uh, the school districts are determining that and working with uh, the teachers and so forth, so they're making decisions on a local basis. So it's just not something that the state is going to get involved in? Um, Secretary French, anything to, uh, I would, uh, we've given the guidance and the districts are making the decisions on their own, the schools themselves, school districts are making those individually. Um, um, thank you, that should do it. All right, Austin, Burlington Free Press. Hi there, uh, I'm eager to follow up on the Hi. sports guidance which uh, could involve several people. Um, and the first question I have has to do with masks. Um, and I'm curious why, how you guys came to the decision of all sports except for cross country when soccer and field hockey players quite often run as much or more than a, a cross country runner would in competition. I think I'm, I'll try and answer part of that. Um, we came to the conclusion that uh, uh, mass for everyone was appropriate. We just uh, had mandatory mass for all Vermonters. Uh, we're having mass in school, uh, and we feel that uh, having the sports, if we're going to continue uh, down that path, that sports should be included as well. I think it has a lot to do uh, with the close contact. 
um, in uh, in soccer, uh, for instance. Uh, you don't get that on a, on a cross country uh, run. Uh, you do get that uh, on a on a field uh, where there's multiple players in contact with one another. Um, I will say uh, some of the uh, the gator type mass. Uh, I went out myself because I wasn't sure how that would work. Um, so I decided to experiment and uh, went out on a uh, 25 mile uh, bike ride, which I haven't done much this year at all. And so I'm a little bit out of shape, but uh, I picked a, a route that had some hills and, uh, and tried to keep the effort up. And I was able to do it uh, without any problem at all. And it was uh, amazing uh, how well you could breathe with the gator type uh, neck uh, um, type of approach uh, masking. So um, that's, from my perspective, that's what uh, happened. I would uh, ask Jay. Probably, if, probably Dr. Levine on the mask. Dr. Levine, anyone else? Yeah, it's the close yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk okay, with you. Okay, so it, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> don't get that very much, There's probably. There's consensus in the room. <laughs> uh, well, Governor, this is so, Secretary Moore. I could maybe sure. offer just a little bit of additional comment, um, which is you, very much to the point that there, to the extent there are opportunities to reduce contact and promote physical distancing, those are certainly the preference. And so there are also, um, as Jay described, modifications being looked or sought for, for cross-country needs, and that includes things like staggered start times. Um, and there, there simply aren't those options to continue to be able to play field-based sports, and that's the reason for masking in, in many sports, but not in cross-country running, where, where that distance can be achieved through an alternative means. Okay, and, and to follow up on just on that, um, given that golf is a fall sport, does that mean golfers are going to be included in the mask mandate? And if so, does that mean casual golfers must play in a, in a mask uh, at some point going forward when this is enacted for high school athletics? So there is work being done in parallel on updating the recreational sports guidance. The guidance that was originally issued back in June was, was fairly limited, and the guidance that will come out in the next couple of weeks is more expansive. Um, and then again, is going to focus on those, those same key messages uh, to the extent that anyone participating in an athletic activity is unable to maintain six feet of physical distance at all times, they should be wearing a mask. And it, the last thing about the masks, uh, just since Friday, uh, we've heard from some folks concerned about, like, they, they've seen headlines or information about health risks trying to play, for example, soccer uh, in a mask. I was curious what information or data or um, expertise uh, perhaps Dr. Levine could offer to, you know, assuage or counter those concerns. I did uh, see that there was a, um, a physician, I believe, uh, that did a 22 mile or maybe even a marathon with a, with a mask on to prove the point that uh, it could be done. But uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, substance of literature that actually uh, counters the use of masks uh, because it could be harmful. Um, so I don't think there's really a lot of support for that. But again, like everything in a pandemic where population has never masked before, I'm sure this will get more and more studied. But I want to reiterate what uh, Secretary Moore said, because it really is just reiterating what the mandate says. Um, so the outdoor use of masks is advised clearly, uh, especially at, at times you, you cannot physically distance. So, so many of the competitive sports we're talking about in the outdoor setting, even though they are outdoors, which is wonderful and protective by itself, uh, one cannot effectively physically distance. Um, I would say that a, a golfer uh, standing uh, at the tee uh, is probably pretty physically distanced from a lot of people um, and should have their mask with them that may not need to wear it every moment that they're on the golf course. Okay, cool. I, I, I'd agree with that. And the last thing I was curious about uh, has to do with football. Um, and it, what, when, what factored into the decision to go for seven on seven versus 11 on 11 football? Jay. 
Uh, that's a good question, Austin. <clears throat> a lot of it comes down to blocking and players being really close to each other, uh, respiratory droplets on each other, breathing on each other. When a player is tackled, there's a whole group of people that are together. Uh, Dr. Raska and Dr. Lee, who are two of the permanent uh, epidemiologists folks for pedi pediatric medicine in state, were part of this committee. And as we discussed that, it became very clear that football was problematic. And you can see that as you look across the nation with many schools already deciding not to have football, many leagues already canceling football, primarily because of those concerns. So by going to a seven on seven type of method, we can get all the kids playing, but also ensure some level of physical distancing with their mask where we can have them play football in a safe way. That's essentially what it comes down to. All right. Thank you, thanks everybody. Joe at the Barton Chronicle. Hello, um, I think this is for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm curious as to um, whether given the amount of experience um, people have with this new virus, uh, if there's any uh, new information about how it works and um, are there new treatment modalities that are pre proving to be more effective? It appears, um, even though the, the number of people uh, who have been infected in the surging states uh, appear to be younger, that the death rate is declining somewhat. And I'm just curious whether that is just good luck or something more than that. Sure. So. When you use the term uh, how it works, I'm going to interpret that as asking what it's doing when it reaches your body and how it gets in and does any damage. And most That's what of, I meant, yes. Yeah, most of that, uh, there's a lot of research going on around a certain receptor in our cells called the angiotensive converting enzyme receptor. and that has raised all kinds of issues regarding certain drugs used to treat high blood pressure, which actually impact that receptor. But so far, most of those studies haven't shown that either being on those drugs or not being on those drugs has an impact on how the course of the illness goes, though people aren't being recommended to be on those drugs that inhibit that receptor necessarily. But getting down to the actual treatments, so for the person who's got a cold with the virus or who has a mild enough illness that they're just staying at home isolated, there's not a lot of advances in treatment for that particular person. But for the person who's sick enough to be in the hospital and whose oxygen levels are suffering because of that, um, there's a lot that's gone on with our knowledge about how to provide oxygen to those people how to provide it in a non-invasive way, if you will, meaning uh, using uh, ventilation mechanisms that don't involve being on an actual ventilator, but a more non-invasive approach where you don't have to have a tube down into your lungs uh, to get the oxygen. So the whole intensive care management of these patients has in, uh, markedly changed since March. With regard to drugs, uh, Vermont and other states continues to get a steady supply of remdesivir, which is an antiviral drug, and it is effective in reducing the uh, severity and duration of the symptoms of the illness. There's also been great work done with a steroid called dexamethasone, which has been very effective, again, in people ill enough to be in the hospital setting. And then lastly, um, on a little bit more experimental basis, but showing great promise and being used actively here in Vermont, actually, is a drug used to treat uh, the immune system in people who have diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. It's a, an immunomodulating drug, if you will, that seems to be somewhat effective um, in managing the course of COVID. So those are sort of the, the hottest things that are going on right now that I can tell you about, short of the, of course, uh, major work going on on vaccine development. And Joe, you may need to hit star six to unmute again if you have any follow-ups. 
give you a second. All right, we'll move to Courtney at Local 22. Hi, um, my question is for Secretary French. Um, you said you would be checking on school districts every month, and I'm just curious how that will work, how you'll be doing it, and how you'll be making sure you know school districts are following those guidelines, health guidelines, and social and emotional guidelines. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, our data collection isn't uh, focused on the health guidance. It's more on what instructional opportunities our students uh, being provided. Uh, so we're anticipating, we're still designing the data collection, but we specifically want to know uh, how many students at each grade level are in in-person remote learning um, or hybrid disposition. But we're still in the process of designing that, but our, our goal really is to focus on issues of equ equity and quality uh, for instructional opportunities. Okay. Will that be kind of like a survey thing that you'll be sending to each school district? Yeah, we have decided, we believe on the survey being the best methodology to do that, but once again, we're still designing the, uh, which data we're gonna collect. We know there's a lot of uh, different interests in that data. Uh, we wanna make sure it's eminently doable for the school districts as well. Uh, but we're still in the process of finalizing that. But our goal is to identify the patterns of equity and opportunity. Will you be doing anything to monitor health guidelines or just kind of you know, giving that school to make sure they're doing it? Yeah, we're, we, we intentionally decided not to take more of a monitoring approach on the health guidance just due to the complexity of the issues involved. We're working directly with districts on that topic, uh, so we have some su surveillance of that, but we'll, uh, we'll reconsider our approach as time goes on. But right now, uh, you know, districts, we have, uh, as I think was alluded to earlier, K-12 is a much more stru structured and regulated environment. Um, our regulations and guidance have the force of regulation and, and licensed educators are required to follow those directions. So we have a very good oversight sort of chain of command, if you will, of that implementation. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, I guess we overlooked one issue uh, last week. Uh, Happy belated birthday. <laughs> and uh, did, did you get a few minutes to at least celebrate? Yeah, no, not really. Um, that's not my favorite day of the year, anyhow. Dick, 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 Thankfully, they only come Dick once Miles a year. Didn't, Dick Miles didn't bring over a fresh <laughs> He did not. Or anything like that. No, no, no special yeah. treatment. He did, he did call and uh, sing me happy birthday, though. Uh, uh, this question is for probably Jay Nichols and or Dan French. Uh, with all the health issues and positive COVID tests and sports we're seeing across the nation with professional sports and, and colleges and universities pulling the plug on sports either for the fall or even through December 31st, why the push for high school sports uh, and how much of this is a carrot to try to ensure students remain in school? Thanks, Mike. I, you know, when I hear questions like that, I always fall back initially on the idea that we're talking about Vermont, right? So as much as we look at national data, whether it be on reopening schools or sports or so forth, I think it's important, again, to just acknowledge that we design our guidance based on a realistic assessment of our conditions. Uh, so that's the first thing. We, we feel fairly confident that we can have sports based on the conditions that we have. But second, to our other points about uh, social emotional development of students, uh, sports play a critical role. Uh, particularly, I would argue, probably more so now uh, as a result of this emergency. And we really worked hard to make sure we could have a path forward for our students to be able, our student athletes to be able to participate in these activities that are so essential not only to their school experience, but also to their own uh, emotional and physical well being. But a lot of kids, you know, stay in school because of sports. So you're saying that there was an extra effort to try to make sure sports were available to these students? We put a lot of effort on ensuring that we could uh, offer activities uh, in the sports area. I mean, it was essential from our perspective, you know, based on once again on our analysis of the public health conditions that we could do it if we if we could come up with the right mitigation strategies. But there certainly was a priority a priority on us endeavoring uh, to do this, largely out of our concern for student well-being. And as far as the VPA, right? Hi, Mike. I'd like the record to show that I've known you for 40-something years. You never worry about my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I will here. Okay. So first of all, uh, we agree with everything that, that Secretary French just said. Um, you know how my feelings on it, and I can share it publicly. We really feel that sports is an extension. Sports and all extracurricular activities are an extension of the school day. One of the things that I'm most proud of in Vermont is that we've always focused on the, the whole person. And sports teach many attributes uh, that we want kids to have. And in Vermont, as the governor has talked about and we've talked about previously, we have very low infection rates. If we're going to ask kids to come back to school in person, which to the, as much as we can, I think we should, we also want to make those extracurricular activities available for them. Uh, there's no place in a better position to do it than our state. We've got mitigation strategies in place that we believe are safe, and we think the mental health ramifications of not having sports is more of a, a worry than actually providing sports. Does that answer your question okay? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both of you. And um, happy birthday. Just want to go back, Mike, uh, again to the positivity rate and why we're unique in so many different ways when we're talking about comparisons to other states. And I'll just go back uh, to New York because I, I believe I have this right. It's always dangerous when I go by memory. But I believe that uh, New York, um, uh, Governor Cuomo had said uh, you can go back and open up schools uh, if you have less than a 5% positivity rate. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, we have 0.04%. Uh, percent. Four tenths of one percent is our positivity rate, probably the lowest in the country. I, we're, we're always consistently one of the lowest, and I think we are the lowest. So put that into perspective, and when you compare that uh, to other states that are up around 10 and 20 percent. So um, we're different, and, uh, and if, again, I'll say it again, if, if we can't do it, I don't believe anyone can. Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I'm glad to hear you're older than I am again. That uh, gives me some comfort. Um, I was wondering if you had a reaction to the President's executive orders, and, and in particular, the, the what would be an extra $100 the state would have to pony up a week for um, unemployment insurance. So it, it sounded like a few weeks ago that would not be feasible for the state to put any more money into that. Yeah, we're, we're assessing that as we speak, uh, Tim. Um, obviously, uh, we want something to continue. Uh, I'm very concerned about those who are unemployed at this point in time. We have um, over 40,000 when you include the PUA with that. I think they need some extra assistance. Uh, to have the $600 uh, extra uh, money uh, cease as of last week, I think it's problematic. Uh, and it doesn't appear that Congress is moving as quick as they should be uh, in terms of coming to some agreement. Uh, so um, the president uh, took a step forward by executive order. I know there's a lot of controversy as whether it's legal or not legal. Uh, we are going to assess that, and if it's, uh, if it's okay to do, we're fine, trying to find a path to doing so. Uh, as well with the extra $100, it's my understanding uh, that you could utilize just 300 and include some of the payment uh, in the, in the uh, unemployment benefit itself as, uh, as the $100. Uh, but if you added the $100, it could come out of uh, your CARES Act money. So we're assessing that as we speak uh, and want to implement that just as quick as we possibly can. Uh, just as a stopgap measure until Congress takes action. Uh, okay, it sounds like you're, you're, you'll uh, do what you can to get that extra hundred dollars. Absolutely, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, okay. go from six hundred to four hundred. Um, I think would be reasonable. Uh, the other question, maybe Jay could answer this question, just occurred to me. What about the are, are the um, the the non-sport ECs? Are are those being left up to the school districts? I'm just not sure about that. I'll let Jay answer that. I just want to go back, uh, Tim. Uh, when, I had, sure. when I had mentioned before uh, that Vermont could not uh, carry the extra money for unemployment, uh, I was talking about the $600. Uh, we certainly sure. could not do that. Uh, the $100 would cost us uh, somewhere in the, if I'm doing the math right, somewhere in the 4 to $5 million a week range. Uh, and if we could use CARES Act money for the next couple, two to three weeks uh, to give Congress more time, and maybe they would reimburse us as well. So uh, I, that's what we're looking at at this point. Jay? Okay. Uh, thanks for that question. 
Uh, the safe and healthy schools guidance that Secretary French talked about, uh, this newest version being uh, coming out, has a little bit of information on that. And we will be providing some information to schools and some supports in that area for things like choral singing, uh, drama productions, th those type of events. Again, the key will be that they'll have to be able to follow the guidance that's in the healthy schools document. And we will work with schools to try to do that. We're also going to be working with Dr. Lee and Dr. Raska to provide frequently asked questions so that principals and teachers can get answers in real time to their particular circumstances. So at this time, that's the best I can answer that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, thank you for taking these questions. Uh, can you comment on the apparent contradiction uh, to your administration's announcement on Thursday that state employees should continue to work remotely uh, through the end of the year to help prevent the spread of the virus and to accommodate state employees' family needs while pressing schools to put teachers and staff back in classrooms and school buildings? Well, again, I, I, I'm going to ask Secretary uh, Young to comment as well. But uh, from my standpoint, this is just an extension of what we're doing today uh, to allow for more capacity, uh, to allow for more flexibility if they can. We uh, encourage any uh, sector uh, to work remotely right now until we can get through this pandemic. Uh, we are poised to do that here in the state of Vermont, so it takes away some of the risks for others and allows uh, for for those who can work at home and uh, can provide for child care at home, uh, it takes uh, some of the, the pressure off from the child care system, for instance. So I think we all have to do what we can uh, as, a, as a team, so to speak, as a state, uh, to allow for others uh, to, who can't, uh, don't have that option uh, to take advantage of, uh, of child care opportunities, for instance. Um, as well, I just, I just think that, uh, again, as we look at school district to school district, uh, we're seeing some uh, who have uh, a hybrid approach, uh, some who've gone to uh, remote uh, uh, remote learning opportunities, and some who have uh, gone to uh, in-person instruction. So it's not across the board. Uh, it's, uh, it's individual uh, to the school districts themselves. Uh, Secretary Young, do you want to comment any further on, on the uh, state employees? Uh, thank you, Governor. You, you pretty much covered the, the groundwork there. Um, Yes, we have a number of state employees who are um, reportedly and, and actually very productive working from home. Uh, with the announcement of the school openings um, in the last week, and, and as the governor pointed out, it varies from district to district, and sometimes it varies you know, within a family, depending on the age of their children and what the programs they're in. Um, it was uh, our, our attempt to help them out in over the next five to six months with some certainty that we would not be calling them back into the work site uh, on a regular 40-hour uh, schedule. So we're providing flexibility to these um, families and to our other state workers who have other challenges presented by the pandemic um, through the end of the year as so long as they um, can remain productive and, and telework um, from their home or other work or, or other site. And Secretary Young, sorry, just going back to Andrew's question, uh, could you just make clear here, this is for folks who can work remotely. We have frontline staff who require, who are required to be on site and have been required to be on site and have been working on site as their job requires since the start of this pandemic, correct? Correct, absolutely. Uh, there we, we really have not stopped working for the most part. Uh, employees who have to be on the work site and provide critical services, especially those in our institutions, those you know who are working hard on the emergency response to the pandemic, have been at work. Those who could um, telework and had a job that was conducive to that, um, they all left the offices uh, at the end of March and have, um, you know, been telecommuting pretty successfully since then. So, so this is uh, applies to those who can telecommute. And it's not a safety concern. It's about convenience for the for the staff who are able to work remotely. But that's right. It does help us keep you know our um, volume down within state offices, so that those who have to be here can socially distance and. 
um, maintain you know the, the requirements that uh, we put in place for the work site uh, so it, it does help with that um, and uh, but primarily the purpose was to provide certainty to these employees I guess I was, um, I was interested in what you would say to teachers who aren't necessarily getting that same level of accommodation and flexibility with what's being asked of them. Um, but uh, if I could uh, move on uh, to a question, quick question for Secretary French. Um, do you have a sense on if schools are adequately staffed for the year? Um, I don't really have a frame of reference, but I see on school spring there are hundreds of positions, uh, including teachers, that are posted in the state of Vermont. And I'm just curious if, if anyone knows if that's a lot and uh, what's being heard from schools, whether they have enough uh, staff. Yeah, thanks. I don't, I don't have insight into uh, the school spring numbers per se, um, but I know, uh, you know part of the, the rationale for deploying the hybrid option locally is to give districts some flexibility and to give their staff some flexibility on how to uh, respond to the emergency, meaning that there might be some staff that uh, could work from home or in a remote environment over other staff and so forth. So I think it's an important consideration and I think, you know, our, this is one of the areas that districts in our state vary from district to district considerably. As you can imagine, the demographics of staff vary greatly. Some staff as a whole are older uh, than some districts rather than others or might have other uh, health concerns and so forth. Uh, so we don't know yet. I think we'll start to get a better picture as districts finalize their plans. Uh, in many cases, those districts that came out early, earlier with their plans are still revising those plans. And as I mentioned previously, some are just finalizing them this week. I think then that the next prompt from that is really to then start having those questions with your staff about who's, who's going to be available or not. So we'll know, I think, certainly here in a couple of weeks as to, to what extent that's a real issue for districts. Is it late in the game to be wondering whether you have enough staff with less than a month to go before schools open? Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to sort of quarterback those kinds of questions. I think we came out rather early as a state with our health guidance for schools. You know, as I mentioned today, we, we, we did a revision that we sort of telegraphed to folks was coming. Um, but in, and certainly with the governor's executive order added on an additional week for that planning. Uh, but I think, you know, that's certainly part of the cause of the anxiety today as we're getting down to the last final weeks of, of doing those preparations. Um, but I think we've done everything we can and we'll continue to do what we can to support our districts uh, in, this, in this challenging work. Okay. Um, uh, I don't want to take up much more time, but just as a point of clarity on masks during sports, um, does that apply now to uh, summer, I'm thinking Little League, summer skilled camps, things like that? Should, should those kids, um, if they're within six feet of each other, be wearing masks? Um, Secretary Moore, are you still on? She's been heading up the, the sports for our cabinet. I, I am governor. Um, so the, uh, the recreational sports guidance is still being revised, but we currently anticipate uh, obviously actively encouraging that now, um, but requiring it effective September 8th when fall high school baseball starts. I think we might have lost you, Julie. Oops, can you hear me now, Governor? Yeah, we can. Okay. I just said that um, while certainly encouraging mask use across all sports currently, uh, the, the requirement for masking in recreational sports will kick in on September 8th, consistent with the start of school based fall sports. Thanks, everyone. Guy Page. Governor, my wife and I went to the Cornerstone restaurant in Barry on Saturday night. Uh, normally a very packed night there uh, only three other parties were there uh, it just seems not not very sustainable uh, and we were wondering since most of the deaths from COVID-19 are in Chittenden County most of the college students are coming back to Chittenden County the interstate maps are already registered by county uh, what would you think about a, a two-tier system with stricter regulations for Chittenden County and left elsewhere and uh, and if not why not well I, I would just offer a guy if you were in a restaurant that's usually packed and uh, there were only three parties there 
uh, that would tell me that they're not even at 50% capacity. So I'm not sure that increasing the capacity uh, would help them. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are cautious and I would uh, include myself, for instance. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm excited about going out in a, in a social uh, way and, and going to, uh, to a restaurant at this point. I think a, a lot of um, a lot of folks are apprehensive uh, about this, so we'll, uh, we'll have to watch this. I'm very concerned uh, about the hospitality sector, uh, restaurants in particular, and, uh, and I think that uh, we have provided for some means of, of financial assistance for them. Uh, we're currently going through that uh, right now and, and establishing grants uh, for that purpose, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to do so until we get through this. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Commissioner Smith. Volunteer church groups are hoping to return to holding safe church services inside Vermont State Prisons. Uh, they say it's an inmate's religious right, just as the general public is allowed to go to church, as long as they are following the CDC guidelines. Uh, has your team and uh, Human Services and Corrections, have you discussed this? And what can these volunteer groups expect? Secretary Smith. Thank you, Guy, for the question. I, I think a lot of things right now are on the table. The, 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 let me just say we are very, very cautious about who comes into the correctional facilities uh, at this point. Um, we have learned uh, through this process that the, that the infection, that the virus comes in from the outside. Uh, and whether it comes in through somebody that's being booked into our facility or it comes in through uh, visitors to our facilities. As you know, we've been very cautious about making sure that those avenues are closed off. So it continues to be closed off uh, until we can get a handle on, um, uh, on our facilities. Uh, and as you know, we've been very, very successful here in Vermont. Uh, in terms of keeping um, the virus out of our facilities with the various protocols that we have in place. That includes limitations on visitation. Uh, to be honest, Guy, I don't see those changing anytime soon. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll make the changes as quickly as we can. Thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Um, hello, can you hear me? I can. Uh, thanks. Uh, a quick one for uh, the doctor and uh, one for Julie Moore, if I may. Um, uh, doctor, when I'd asked you about the, uh, the test for the coronavirus and their seven types, and you mentioned the, uh, the cross-reactivity of an assay and the specificity, um, could you tell me uh, what you know or you think is uh, the percentage of, of COVID-19 tests that are 100% on, uh, and what's the error rate and uh, the accuracy for the most common tests? Are you talking uh, the PCR tests versus the antigen tests or any specific type? I believe the one that goes to the lab, I believe. Yeah, so the PCR test, the, the most commonly used test. Um, so I wish I could give you a hard and fast number. Uh, the FDA has literally put out tens of emergency use authorizations for PCR tests, some of them going to the lab, as you described, some of them uh, point of care tests. And uh, I'm not sure they, can, they could even help us with all of them at this point in time and tell us which ones have as good specificity as you're talking or not. Um, I will say that generally speaking, if I could do that, the specificity of those tests is relatively high and sometimes it's the sensitivity that varies a bit. So the specificity, as you know, means that if we get a positive result, we can count on it being a true positive and it's not a false positive. Um, but I would say, as a blanket statement, there is no test we do 
in healthcare that has 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity. That, that doesn't exist. So it's never going to be perfect. And when you put all of these tests together, you'll come out with pretty high specificity, but I'm not sure um, of an exact number just because literally this has been so fast moving with so many tests approved, um, not always with a lot of data behind them. Most of the tests, when you, if you read, if you will, the package insert, will talk about uh, the assays they did to get the test authorized. And it will show that every case that had known virus in it was picked up accurately by these tests. Uh, but that's not the same as what is it really going to do in clinical use and when you uh, do the test on a lot more specimens than are required to just get it authorized. So I'm beating around the bush a little only because that's being transparent. That's all I can do. All right, thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Julie, um, last time we spoke, uh, you suggested that, that I go out and uh, maybe take some pictures and send them along uh, about where, uh, where there is no buffer zones and where there are, you know, a runoff from like the cornfields up here. And mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you know that like for the past 15 years, I've pointed out uh, where these point sources are. And I, I even showed the folks from AA and F and M where 15 feet of river bank had been removed, uh, where there are old uh, river crossings that, that drain these continuous cornfields uh, using chemical fertilizers. They drain right into the river. With all the folks you have uh, at your disposal at the ANR and the DEC and the AA F and M, uh, couldn't you uh, have some state employees? like come out and walk uh, the rivers or streams uh, up here, uh, say November, and maybe, uh, you know, take a look for yourselves. Sure, so um, the Agriculture Agency does have a team of inspectors. Uh, they divide up their work based on the, the size of the farm operations, whether it's large, medium, or small. Large farms are inspected every year. Um, medium farms, I believe, once every three years, and small farms once every seven years. The small farm requirement in particular is still one that, that's relatively new to, to all of us. Um, and in fact, had a conversation with Secretary Tevis about um, that work this morning and how it's proceeding. Uh, and we are, they're still in the process of making their, their first rounds of those inspections. But my understanding is part of, of the work they do when they are on site um, is to do some, some targeted visits to field locations as well. Um, you know, this, part of the challenge is that there are over 400,000 acres to the best of my knowledge in, in active agriculture, either in annual crops, hay, hay or uh, pasture at this point. And so it's simply not possible to, to view every every square foot of those fields. Um, but I know that they have a thorough and targeted approach, and frankly, a methodical one um, that they're working their their way through. To the extent uh, we receive complaints and can do some targeted investigation work, which is why I encourage you to to share uh, photos or addresses. We're, we're happy to follow up. Um, but otherwise, it is this methodical approach that the agencies are deploying um, to identify problems and ultimately implement solutions. You know, it doesn't seem to be so much the farms themselves that uh, a lot of this is, uh, you know, rented bottomland along the rivers and uh, it's continuous corn year after year and it's just gushing right into the rivers. But I'd be more than happy to send some addresses or uh, locations along. Please do. Yeah, great. All right, thank you all very much. Avery, WCAX. Hello, my question is about all four. Has there been any indication of um, how many students would be interested now with these guidelines? With these guidelines, if they're really interested in playing sports with the math guidelines and things like that? Um, f fairly new um, in terms of the announcement and the guidelines, and I think it would be hard to assess, but I'll ask uh, Jay if he wants to comment. Uh, thanks for your question. I, I think that is one that we're going to have to see. We know we have roughly around 10,000 students that participate in sports at the high school level. 
And I think many of those uh, kids are waiting to get on the field. I've talked to my own grandson, who's a soccer player, and you know, <clears throat> obviously he doesn't want to wear a mask, but he would rather wear a mask and play than not be able to play. And I think that's where most kids are going to fall. They're going to have the opportunity to be physically active. Um, they're going to be doing it in a way that hopefully will assure that parents understand that we're taking safety seriously. And again, they'll get the opportunity to play, which is better than what a lot of places are having and better than what we faced in the spring. And are you confident you'll be having enough players to field teams? Absolutely. Um, and finally, just a quick follow-up about wearing the mask. Is, is there going to be any guidance on what type of mask that are going to be required? I actually just read a, a ranking of some of the masks and the garter ones that the governor mentioned rank the lowest and even could be worse with releasing uh, particles. So I'm wondering if there's, if there's going to be any sort of restrictions on that. We don't have any guidance on what types of masks will be, be worn at this time. Uh, I just, we just know that any mask, any type of cloth mask, is better than no mask at all in terms of transmitting the disease. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. I, I would also say uh, that the, the gator uh, type of mask, uh, we have to be realistic here. Uh, we are asking them to, to utilize them while they're playing and, and going through some effort and some activity. Um, so, as Jay had said, I think having some mask is better than no mask, and, uh, and I believe that this is the right approach as we move forward. Thank you. Eric, time Sargis. Yes, this uh, question is for Secretary French. We've been hearing nationally that there may be uh, efforts of protests or strikes from teachers who don't want to go back in the classroom. Last week, Superintendent Bonesteel said that she had spent much of her day discussing uh, with her staff about the concerns they have about coming back to school. Uh, does the state, is the state hearing anything similar about teachers maybe not showing up and is there any kind of plan in place? There is a lot of teachers who don't show up to work. Yeah, we haven't heard of that kind of uh... Uh, sort of, uh, I want to say, mass interest. Um, I know uh, Superintendent Bonesteel has been particularly vocal about uh, the child care concerns, which are concerns that we share as well. Um, and I think in her case, and particularly if I remember correctly, she, uh, perhaps through the proximity to Interstate 89, has a number of staff who work uh, in different districts in which they live. Um, so there's a, you know, with a mismatch of schedules, there's uh, emerging child care issues. And I think that's true across the entire state. Um, we had child care issues prior to the emergency, but this has certainly been exacerbated by, by the emergency itself, and it's one we've prioritized uh, to work on. So is it fair to say if a bunch of teachers don't show up September 8th, the schools will just shut down? Well, I think staff availability is a, cre a key a logistical concern for school district to maintain operations. That's why, you know, once again, why we thought in particular, it was important to put the hybrid option on the table for districts to help navigate some of those types of issues. Um, I think it would have been problematic uh, to insist on fully in-person, and certainly I don't think the public health conditions warrant insisting on remote learning 100% either. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging dynamic, uh, but once again, I think it underscores why districts need to have those conversations with their parents and their staff to resolve these issues as best they can. Thank you. Colin, seven days. Hi, I want to follow up on something Dr. Levine said earlier. Um, I think it was in response to a question about a specific um, case where someone had some certain health issues and their loved one working at school. I guess I'm just curious as to um, what teachers should do, I guess, when they're being revised to not work in a school building, whether because of their own health or one of their loved ones, yet schools are um, refusing to allow them to work remotely. I mean, is that happening? Are there any cases you're aware of? Or is the state getting involved at all? Uh, this is Secretary French. Uh, we're not necessarily getting involved on specific HR issues, and that's, that's ultimately what this becomes. Our guidance does speak to a list of personnel that should consult. Uh, with their primary care providers, firstly, because I think that's where that risk assessment needs to occur. Um, and that risk assessment's based on, you know, not only an assessment of their condition, but also a work environment that might uh, be such that it would require uh, or be difficult to maintain social distancing. So that, that kind of conversation begins with the individual's primary care provider. Um, and then certainly uh, working with their district's HR uh, department to resolve and to come up with some accommodations. 
Um, and what if there aren't accommodations? Um, what, what if that's not? I mean, how do you know if that's happening? Are you hearing from any teachers who are saying that they're struggling to get their schools to accommodate their needs? Yeah, we just would fall back on the typical HR uh, laws and, and regulations that are available in Parenting Leave Act and so forth that covers family illness and personal illness. Uh, so some mechanisms there, and uh, I know those conversations are going on, but once again, it's not something we would necessarily, uh, from the Agency of Education standpoint, get involved in those sort of local HR decisions. And, and could you just, um, can you just expand on that a little more as why, I understand why you're saying this is a local decision, but um, to be fair, the, I think the state is getting involved um, and has been involved since the pandemic began and what, what traditionally in previous years we considered local decisions. I mean, why not um, get involved in a case in, in, in a case like that where um, teachers feel like they're not safe, but it, it seems like the message to them is work with your school district. Um, why is that the preferred approach versus um, trying to handle it on a statewide level? I think the, the HR issues in particular are rather easy to explain in that regard because the bottom line is uh, the Agency of Education doesn't really have any statutory or regulatory authority over these issues. Uh, a lot of these issues come down to employment a law, uh, collective bargaining law, and so forth. It's just We just don't have the authority to uh, become involved in this kind of issue. And, and lastly, um, Governor, it's a totally different topic, but I, I'm curious if you um, you had mentioned sounds like the state would be willing to um, put up the hundred dollars necessary for the um, president's executive order. I mean, have you heard anything in the last couple of days? Do you have any any idea of how realistic it is that this actually happens? Um, and are you, I guess, are you advocating for it to happen? Well, we're we're assessing the situation right now. Uh, we're just contemplating what the steps are to, to get there. Um, and, uh, and if we can do it, we want to do it. We want to move forward. So uh, we're taking uh, every step possible. Obviously, we'll have to talk with the, uh, the legislature uh, about using some of the CARE uh, funds to supplement the, the extra $100 on top, and uh, we'll work jointly with them. Uh, but, uh, but we'd like to do this as soon as possible if there's a path forward. And is your understanding that the state would need to set up some type of new system to administer this money, or would this be something that would be able to be put out through the existing unemployment um, insurance systems? And if the state does have to set up a new system, how confident are you, given the recent challenges, that the state would be able to do that on a, on a quick basis to get this money out? Yeah, we're trying to assess that right now, but it's, uh, it's my understanding that we can do it through the existing system. If we had to build a new system, uh, that would be definitely be problematic, uh, and that would uh, slow the process down, and may not be uh, workable for the at least the uh, the, the immediate future. Um, so um, we're uh, again assessing this as we speak. Uh, hopefully, we'll come to some conclusion uh, where we can move forward, or uh, that Congress acts quickly, as they've done at times in the past. Uh, it's surprising uh, how quickly they can move um, when uh, when need be. And so uh, hopefully that they'll uh, come to some conclusion, we can just continue with the process that we're, uh, we're experiencing at this point in time. Thank you. Pam Davis. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, just a question for Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, you and the other kids on your team have, done, have really nailed the, the virus in the first phase, sort of the spring and the early spring and late spring. Um, but I'm curious about what you're getting. You seem to be getting a second surge now, not of cases, but of variables. And my question is kind of a curveball question, but I'm curious whether um, you may having to make all of these judgments. And I'm wondering whether. Um, it makes sense to begin to use to develop, makes sense to develop a uh, some kind of an epi epidemiological set of curves to ant so that you can follow and get more rigor into the way that you're going to manage going forward. For example, the uh, I understand that the kindergarten kids at, at, uh, at, in uh, um, Edmonds Elementary School um, are going to go to school two days out of five. Um, and other kids are going, there are all kinds of other patterns out there. 
um, at the same time as that's happening, you get, you're getting much more speculation in your field, medical field, about the differential uh, effect on, on various cohorts of people so that young kids, grade kindergarten through say two or three, may be very, very different from what happens in, 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 uh, with adolescents, say in junior high or early high school. And um, so you're going to have to figure that out. And everything that I hear sounds like that you're that you you know that those variables are all out there and that they're tricky. Okay, I just wonder whether it would, whether it'd be possible to develop using some kind of epidemiological function so that you could get curves that would um, that would provide guidance. So those the epidemiological curves in the early stages of the COVID. Seem to me to be have been very valuable and to help you. It wasn't the whole thing in any in any way, but it was valuable in your ability to deal with the thing first. Is that is that a crazy idea? Nothing you ever say is crazy, Ken. Uh, so let's take a step back. The step back would be what we do uh, at this conference every Friday, which is look at the kind of metrics that we're always looking at and making sure that uh, we don't approach what Commissioner Pichak calls those guardrails. Uh, so looking at, looking at the syndromic surveillance data across the state, looking at the test positivity across the state, hospital utilization, um, numbers of new cases, um, percent increase in new cases, et cetera. So we always start with that baseline, whether that's, you know, because who knows what's impacting that at any point in time. Is it the schools reopening? Is it the college students returning? Is it uh, travelers coming for the summer or for the fall or what? Um, so we need to keep our eye on that consistently. What you're now talking about is looking at the traditional epi curve, as you called it, which really tries to map out new cases and uh, give you a visual over time uh, comparing your total number of cases, your numbers of new cases, your percent increase in cases. And then you can try to theorize or hypothesize based on what's going on. Well, was that caused by the sudden increase in our college student population because all of the colleges have started to uh, return? And is that what these cases are related to or not? Is it related to September 8th has now occurred and we have students coming back to school? So it shouldn't be too challenging for us to be able to um, look at the cases in that context. And we'll also be able to actually look at the cases themselves, because obviously every night when we post new cases, we, we have an idea of what their age is, their sex is, where in the state they're located. Uh, so we get valuable information that way. So I think we'll be able to continue to do things the way you're describing. Um, looking uh, on a week-by-week -week basis at what is actually happening around us and how is that impacting. The big difference comparing now to March is that in March all we could do was look at it and feel a bit helpless because we didn't have appropriate PPE, we didn't have appropriate testing capacity, uh, no one did. Um, now we are so well equipped in all of those areas that we can look at that data and say fine, can we contain uh, this potential cluster? Can we contain these numbers of cases um, in our effective <laughs> testing and contact tracing strategy? And that will be the world of difference compared to before. Uh, Dr. Kelso, does that well, that takes... cover that well enough? Okay. Did that well, cover that well enough for you, Ham? Uh, yes, yes. The only thing I would just add, Dr. Levine, is that I understand that, but the, the uh, um, if you have to, re if you have to uh, put the thing into it, <clears throat> using, uh, trying to find another metaphor for um, the governor's quarter turn of the spigot, if you have to turn it back, it's going to be hellacious difficult to do that. If you start to have to start backing down and start closing stuff again, it would help, I think, politically to have some mathematical rigor behind that to the extent that it's possible. The only other thing I would say is, it's very common in modeling, and basically that's what the epidemiological curves do, they model, and they can t so they can tell you things. It's very common for, for models to be succeeded by other models 
that have to break things down the more the smaller pieces. So I I, I, I say I, this is just a, this is a curveball, Dr. Uh, mean I just so I'm it, it, and you 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 and the team have have as good credentials in the country as anybody to deal with that. I just think it would be might be interesting to have that curve. Anyway, thank you. No, well, thank you, and believe me, we will have our eyes on the ball every second. Alec, Burlington Free Press. Hi, um, my name is Alec. I'm from the Burlington Free Press. I wanted to thank you all for uh, having this uh, press conference. I have a question if we could go back to um, the unemployment benefits from the executive order. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more more about Vermont's ability to afford the extra $100. Yeah, um, again, we're trying to assess uh, what that means. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, we could use some of the CARES money that the uh, Congress had, uh, had uh, uh, forwarded to us, um, and we do have some of that uh, ability left. We do have money uh, left in the, uh, the CARES fund. So um, that could be utilized, and, and it's really about a stopgap measure. As I said before, um, back of the napkin, I'm thinking it's four to five million dollars uh, a week, um, and so that would give uh, time for us to get to a, a point where Congress takes action. Um, my our goal, uh, my goal is to uh, make sure that the people are, are left uh, somewhat financially secured. We have. Uh, over uh, 40,000 people still on unemployment in the, the PUA. And so it's important to me uh, that they have that security uh, as Congress makes its way uh, through a decision uh, and, uh, and, s and some of what they're uh, trying to come to conclusion on with the, uh, with the White House. Great, thank you. And if I could ask one more question. Um, so I know that you spoke a little bit about uh, going and looking at the plan, and that you're still assessing the plans of um, various universities within the state. Um, but I was looking at those plans, it seems like there's a little bit of a conflict in between how much authority universities have on off-campus students. I'm wondering if um, you, I don't know if you've thought about this at all, but if you have any opinions on, um, on, on that, because I know that they have a lot of authority over on-campus students and an outbreak within the campus community, but if outbreaks start to happen because of off-campus students, how much the university is responsible for those students? Um, again, I might uh, point you in the direction of the university itself. Uh, I know UVM, uh, for instance, right. has a contract uh, with their students, and whether how strong that is, uh, I'm not sure from a legal standpoint. Um, but I'm very concerned yeah. about the off-campus activities. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, we're still trying to contemplate that. We're working on a possible solution. You might hear more about that on Friday, as a matter of fact. Okay. Thank you so much. Yep. That's it. Thank you very much for tuning in. I want to thank everyone, uh, Jay and others, uh, for coming today. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on Friday.